and your religion in the way. Now, I have been raised in tradition. I have been raised in religion. And a lot of times all that got in the way of actually surrendering and the relationship with Jesus. We all have traditions. We all have aspects of our walk with God that are religious. It's its just the nature. It's the nature of being in it. But I just challenge us to surrender. Make room for God. And what does God ask for us? He doesn't ask us to have traditions. He doesn't ask us to have religion. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. See, if I, if I can just live out those two things, I'm good. Because we're real people with real issues, finding real hope. We don't find real hope in tradition. We don't find it in religion. We find it in surrendered living to those two things. Love the Lord your God with everything you got. And love your neighbor as yourself. There's lots of ways we can define who our neighbor is. Sometimes we make it this super spiritual thing. It's actually the person that lives right next door to you. Your actual neighbor is who you're called to love. The person that works next to you in the cubicle at work. That's your neighbor. The person you hang out with at sporting events, your youth, your kids' events. That's your neighbor. Let's surrender to him. Lord, I thank you today, Lord, that you've not called us to tradition or religion. You have called us to love you with all of our being and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So, Lord, we surrender to you today. Whatever you want to do, whatever you want in our lives, we surrender. Lord, help us not to get caught up in ourselves that we miss out on what you have for us. So we declare it. We surrender to you today in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Wow, you can be seated this morning, worship team. Great job. Thank you for leading us into the presence of God. Amen. I love it. All right. Hey, I'm so excited. We're in week two of our series and our friend, my friend, uh, Pastor Josh Reeves is going to bring the word today. Um, equip to thrive, equip to thrive. So give it up for Pastor Josh. Thank you. The three of you that clapped. That was nice of you. Appreciate it. It is great to be with you. And now for, um, it is great to be with you, and I just want to, hey, Pastor Tracy, I just want to give you props really quick. You put shorts and a shirt on. You didn't come without clothes, even though Shelly's out of town, so that's a good thing, and they match, so that that's a big plus. I Okay, that's good. She laid them out before she left. Okay. Um, my wife is also not here. I usually think that the only reason they invite me to come is so that Leah will come and hang out with you guys. But uh, she's actually at a baseball tournament with my son, Caden, this morning up in uh, Folsom. And they're getting rained on. What? So um, that, that was pretty awesome. But uh, he's a, this is a third day of a third day, three-day tournament. And uh, he's a baseball player, loves it. My son, last week, Devin was here with you playing the keyboards. And he's serving over at the uh, Modesto campus this morning. And I talked to my friend Gary Schmidt last week who was playing guitar and leading. And he talked about what a great 
time that he had, and he actually said to me this, Pastor Tracy, he said it was probably the best message that he's heard preached in years last week. If you're here last week, you know that that is the case. If you weren't here last week, you need to get online, find it, and listen to it because it was a great message. I listened to it myself. God moved through you, Pastor Tracy, and he's moving right here at One Church Riverbank. Amen? So if I say amen like that, I expect you to like go, amen, right back at me. You got to talk back. So let's try it. Amen? amen? All right. All right. All right. We got to get going. If you have your Bibles, open them up to the book of Ephesians. Uh, Equipped to Thrive is what we're talking about. And we're talking about gaining sight today. I'm going to get right to it so that I don't preach too long because I like to preach. A few years back, I went to Fiji. Oh, by the way, if you don't know me, my name is Josh and and uh, man, I, I love getting to come and hang out with you guys. Um, last year, last week, I actually got to speak at One Church Turlock, and that was cool, but it wasn't Riverbank, so it was all right. <laughs> Don't tell them I said that. Um, so uh, a few years back, I went on a mission trip to Fiji, um, and uh, I, this was I was a youth pastor at the no, I was a senior pastor, lead pastor at the time. So um, I was enjoying taking a group to Fiji on this medical mission trip. We provided uh, dental uh, assessments and, and some tooth removal and stuff like that for the people in like some of the villages in Fiji out, out of the city. F- Fijian people are some of the greatest and nicest people that you met, that you would meet. And it, what's crazy is when I meet somebody who grew up in Fiji here in the United States, because I'll do that here in my job. Sometimes I'll meet somebody at an open house. I'm a real estate agent. Blah, blah, blah. I'll meet them at an open house, and they'll say, like, oh, yeah, we're from Fiji. And I was like, oh, really? What island? And so then, oh, really? Do you know? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's my cousin. It's really crazy in Fiji. I mean, like, they know everybody. It's really a cool thing. Um, but but we're doing this medical stuff, so we were doing, like, um, general stuff for people, just doing a general assessment on people's lives in these villages where they didn't have any medical care. We are doing dental stuff, eye exams, blood pressure te- tests, because there's a lot of problems with high blood pressure, diabetes, sugar tests. We're doing all these different medical things, and it's a great inroad into the community where people are trying to maybe plant a church or, or, or get involved. And so I, with my friend Steve, Steve Edwards doing this great stuff, one of my funny stories I'm just going to tell you has nothing to do with my message, but this one lady came in, she had one tooth, and it was majorly infected, and the dentist was like, we got to pull it. And she was sitting there, she was like, don't take my tooth, don't take my tooth. She had one tooth, but she didn't have that tooth when she left. So hopefully they're able to find her some implants or something to work it out. But what I want to talk to you about is this one lady who came in. And she came in like, like with a cane. It wasn't our, our normal red and white cane for blind people. It was just a cane, a staff, and she because she couldn't see anything. She No depth perception. She wasn't able to see. She came in. They did the general thing. They sent her over to get eyeglasses, and they did the eyeglass test on her, and it was like she can't see. Like, But they're checking her, and they're like, what we need is these special glasses. And so the person goes through who is leading the charge over there, and we had all these prescription glasses set up, all these different types and, you know, strengths and all those things that I don't know anything about. But, um, and she was like, we, we don't have it. And so what she did is she gathered the group that was in the eyeglass area together, about five to seven people. And they said, we need to pray that God would bring a pair of glasses for this poor lady who can't see anything. So they gathered, they looked through the glasses, multiple people looked through the glasses, they gathered, and they began to pray, God, provide for this lady. And all of a sudden, they go back, and there's this pair of glasses that nobody had seen before. They grabbed them, put them on the the lady, and she started to cry. And she said, that's what a tree looks like? She's looking out the window. I've never seen a tree before. She, she kind of saw like a, a little blurry thing, but she never was able to really see a tree or a blade of grass or a person. And she just was weeping, and she's like, I can see. Man, the way that God used us on that trip. Here's the deal. Have you ever experienced being blind maybe to something 
Not necessarily blind in sight, but blind to something. Not having a knowledge for something. Maybe it was going to the ocean for the first time and experiencing that, and you're just like, whoa. Maybe it was taking that bite of dessert that's just heavenly, and you're like, oh, my eyes are open now. Oh, my gosh. Frank's having a moment with Jesus right now. I remember um, my grandfather was 80 years old, and, and I grew up in, in Oakhurst, California, so about 3,000 feet elevation. And one uh, December, uh, they came up for Christmas, and, and uh, I remember him walking to the sliding glass door of our house and looking out, and he goes, it's snowing. It's Christmas. I'm 80 years old. I'm having a white Christmas. And a tear filled his eye as he experienced something for the first time. I mean, those are some really great things. You see, I believe that this Bible and our relationship with God, it can be about knowing but not knowing. And in this passage of Ephesians that, that Paul is writing to Ephesus, a city that was a port city, that was a major trade hub, and he's writing it from a Roman prison to the people of Ephesus with all these temples that Pastor Tracy talked about, 50 different temples as Pastor Tracy talked about in the city. And he's writing to these people and he's saying to them, I want you to know something. I'm going to go ahead and read this passage out of Ephesians 1, chapter 15 and 23, and that's where we're going to leap from today. I'm going to talk about four things in the time that we have this morning. Chapter 15 reads like this. Excuse me, verse 15 reads like this. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you. Isn't that great? That's good right there. Remembering you in my prayers. Come on, somebody be praying. I keep asking the Lord God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray, here we go, the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches, you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, that you may know of his incomparable great power for us who believe that the power, the same as the mighty strength he inherited, he exerted, excuse me, when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly father, heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is evoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as I endeavor to, to declare your word, God, that the words on the page would move from here through our minds to our heart and you would cause change in us. Lord, we believe that when we speak your word, it does not return void because your Bible says this. And so, God, we have faith to believe that you're going to work in each of us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I like to eat. Does anybody else like to eat? In fact, I think that's my wife and I's love language, by the way. Like, like that's how we express love to each other. We go out to eat with each other. People ask my wife and I, what do we like to do? And we like, eat. We like to go have good food. I'm a La Perea guy. I told my son, Devin, I'll meet you after church at La Perea because their burrito mojado is like the best thing ever with the grilled chicken no sour cream, but guacamole with their green sauce on the top. I hope you guys ate breakfast, because if not, you're really hungry right now. I mean, that burrito mojado is my jam. But there's this place in town that if I hear somebody's going, I'm like, you got to try the pasta. 
you've got to try the shrimp, bacon, chili, sriracha, whatever it is, pasta. It is the best pasta dish I have ever put in my mouth. No, 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 no. Don't go for anything else but the pasta. In fact, don't eat for the whole day before you go because the pasta, you're going to want to finish it. It is that good. I want people to experience this pasta dish that I've experienced because it is that good. Is it good, Tracy? I think we had it. It's good. Okay. He, 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 does, he didn't think it was as good as I do, but it's good. It's, it's pasta. It's not steak. Okay, I get you. I get you. Um, so pasta, this pasta dish. I'm not a big pasta guy, but when I go to this place, I got to have the pasta. I want people to be enlightened to the understanding of how good this pasta dish is. And the way that they do it is by not just hearing about it, but by experiencing it. Just like the woman in Fiji went from not being able to see to seeing, I, I believe that what Paul is writing to the book of, uh, to the, in the book of Ephesians is, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. That you would not just know, but that you would know. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about equipped to thrive here and talking about gaining sight. To be enlightened is to be clarified, eyes open, educated. Paul is praying that the eyes of the Ephesian church, the Ephesus church, would be open and educated to four things this morning. And that's what we're going to talk about. The first thing is to hope. The first thing that Paul mentions in this kind of prayer for them is that they would gain sight in hope. Hope is a powerful thing. It is a powerful thing. Not, but, but we throw it around sometimes. You know, I know that some of you are Raiders fans in here. And I've heard there's stuff going on in the Raiders stuff this week. And you all have hope that the Raiders will have a great season. And again, you will all be disappointed. <laughs> hope. Hope. A lot of times, our hope isn't based in something that is necessarily fact. We can say, I hope, as a teenager, you might hope that that guy or that girl likes you. You may hope you can pay your bills, even when you look at your checking account and you don't have the money. You can hope. Sometimes we use the word hope in talking about something that's not necessarily going to happen. Oh, I hope so. And it's this fleeting idea of hope. But that is not biblical hope. Because biblical hope is based in faith and belief in something outside of ourselves. Biblical hope comes from this measure of faith of what God has done and we believe that he will do. Somebody say amen. amen. The hope into which he has called you is not some worldly idea of hope. I hope that the Raiders win. It's this belief that we have a hope in our Savior and our King. It's a place of understanding not only who you are, but whose you are. Oh, you, you like that? Uh-huh. Last week, Pastor Tracy talked about the tapestry, about this, this, this tapestry. And if you look behind it, you look at the chaos of the strings going every which way, the ribbons, whatever they were, going every which way. But when you turn it around, you see this beautiful tapestry of, of the, the, the picture that looks so nice and so good. But when you look at the back, it doesn't look like that. And so often, you and I look at our lives, and we're like, God, my life is jacked up. But it's God working together in our lives this beautiful tapestry to make this beautiful design out of our lives that when it is done, we can look back and we can go, only God, only God. I know that when I look at my life and the ups and the downs and the lefts and the rights and all those kinds of things, as we're singing, I will make room for you this morning. I'm thinking, God, I need to make room for you again in my life. Because we can overfill our lives with, with kids and activities and going out to eat or not going out to eat and all this stuff going on in our lives. And all of a sudden it's like, God, I need to make room for you. I need to make room for you. 
You see, we have a hope in Christ that even though our lives looks messy, even though we experience hardship and pain and frustration, even though it looks from time to time like we're spinning out in our lives, we have a hope in Christ that he's weaving together this beautiful tapestry of our lives. We have a hope in heaven that is an internal dwelling place for us once this life is over. We have a hope that we will come face to face with God Almighty in this eternal dwelling. It is not a passing hope. It's not just something that's desired that we hope will happen, but it is a deep-seated hope in Christ. Our hope encourages us to live not as a victim in this world, but as a victor in this world. The second thing I want to talk about this morning is gaining our sight Gaining sight of worth. Hmm. Gaining sight of worth. Paul writes in Ephesians, uh, the riches of his, of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. I was at... Uh, I walked into the Ripon campus one day uh, for church. My son had a baseball tournament at <laughs> baseball. We love baseball. He loves baseball. Uh, he had a baseball tournament at Missland Park. And so I dropped him off. And then I drove over to the Ripon campus to catch their first service. And I, I walked in and a guy caught me and his wife. And we were talking for a while. They're a little bit older than me. And I don't know him really well. But we were talking for a minute. And just like, uh, and then the husband's like, hey, I'm going to go use the restroom really quick before service starts. And I'm like, okay, old men bladder. And so he... I was, uh, sorry, I was talking about you. <laughs> anyway, uh, so he ran to the bathroom, and uh, and uh, so his, his wife was like, it's his birthday today. I don't know what to get him. I was like, it's his birthday today, and you're saying you don't know what to get him? She was like, yes, he doesn't need anything. I was like, what are you going to do? She's like, I don't know. She's like, I know what I'll get him. And so it's like she's running down these things with me. This is a guy who's doing very well in life and has done for a long time. And his wife is sitting there going like, I can't think of anything to get him for his birthday. I think about that with my kids today. My kids get, they've got the Xbox and the PlayStation that they already spend too much time on. I don't want to get them more video games or anything like that. You know, they've got stuff. What do you get them? They either want something that's like an Amazon gift card or they want something that's going to cost a lot, a lot of money. Right? Isn't it hard? I mean, some of you wives are like, I hate buying stuff for my husband. I hear that from my wife all the time. All right? But what about if you had to buy something for God? What if you had to get something for God? What would you get the God who created the universe and everything in it? What would you get the God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills? What would you get that God? And, and Paul is asking that question. He's making the statement. He's wanting to give sight to our eyes. And not only so that we know, but that we know that the glorious inheritance of his holy people. What do you get a God who's got everything? His inheritance. And what is his inheritance? You are. You are. What do we get, God? We get God us and others like us. We are his inheritance. We are the thing that God does not have until we give ourselves to him. Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus, and he's wanting to, he's wanting to say to them, I, I want you to not just know it, but I want you to open your eyes to the fact that you are the value. You are it. First Peter says you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a rare treasure belonging to God. So often we walk around in our lives feeling like we are not good enough, we're not smart enough, and people don't like us. That's a Saturday Night Live clip if you didn't catch it. But we feel like we don't, we're not, we don't measure up, we're not good enough. Do you know that Christ Jesus came to this earth sent by God the Father to give his life for you because you were worth more than his son hanging out in heaven with him because he wanted to have a relationship with you. You are worth more than Christ's life. 
Ephesians 3, 17 and 18 says, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp, to understand, to be enlightened, to open your heart to know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. He loves you so much that he that in Psalms 103 it says, For as high as the heavens above and the earth is, so great is his love for you. Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, and he's saying, I want your eyes to be open, your, the eyes of your heart to be open to how much God loves you. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you will do, God loves you. You. Third thing, gaining sight for power. Hmm. I'm going to skip the reading of the scripture because our time is limited here today. But I just want to tell you, my parents and I, um, my parents co-own this property with three other families, four other families for years, 40 years. And uh, a couple of the people had passed away. That was a bummer. And then one of the other families they co-owned with decided they wanted to move to Texas. See you later. And so... They, my parents were left with this property that um, the other people still co-owned it, but my parents were left with this property, and they're like, okay, so everybody else wants to sell it, so we'll go ahead and sell it. So they put it up on the market to sell the property, and um, it wasn't really getting a lot of action. It's 16 acres of land, and um, it had a, this old barn on it, metal building, and then it also had a, a house that was super dilapidated. So somebody comes in and gives us a total low ball offer on the property. Us. I'm not a part of it. It's my parents. But it's us. And so, so my parents were like, hey, we got an offer. They're telling me, we got an offer on the house and it's blah, blah, blah. I was like, whoa, that's really low. I went, hey, mom and dad, why don't we buy it? And you can use your part of ownership in it as the down payment. So then we only have to finance a little, little bit. They're like, let's do it. Yeah, we'll keep it in the family. Yada, yada, yada. And so we went for it. We bought it. And it's 16 acres, very inexpensive, and um, had a house on it. So we got a contractor out there, right? The contractor goes through the house, and he's like, yeah, yeah. So we got to tear the roof off and do all new joists on the house. <laughs> awesome. Money, money. And this back here is totally molded out. And so we got to just kind of tear this whole wall area, redo this whole thing. And so, like, we're counted, and we're like $250,000 to redo this house. It was a big place, like, and $250,000. I'm like, how much would it cost us to bulldoze this thing and put a brand new house that's the way we want it? Because this house, we were going to have to make these major adjustments and put insulation, and then the rooms weren't really set up right, and, like, it was going to be a pain. I'm like, how much to just, like, bulldoze it and start over? And so they, we got a number for that, and it was less than the number of redoing it. You know, sometimes it's a lot easier to, to start new than, than to redo the bad. Yeah, yeah. But that's not how God works. That's not how God works. You see, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23 tells us. God doesn't see you and say, ah, they're too far gone. We got to start over. No, God invests in us. And he does this by sending his son to forgive us of our sins, and then sending his Holy Spirit to dwell inside of us. That we can have the same power within us that raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand. You see, we bring our scars, our sins, our failures, our doubts, and God doesn't demo us and start over. No, he starts reconstructing and reinvesting into our hearts so that we can live with the power that God has. What Paul is writing to us and wanting to us to open our eyes to is that the power that saved Christ from the, raised Christ from the dead, the same power exerted authority over all of creation, dominion in all the things is the same power that lives within us for those who believe in Christ. 
We need to grasp this so that our lives can be changed. And lastly, in wrapping up this morning, we need to get, gain sight about Jesus and the church. I miss my wife today. She makes me better in every aspect of my life, but she's weird. She loves to read. She loves to read. Anybody else love to read? Okay, the three, four of you in here, that's awesome. She loves to read. She loves to read like crime or suspense kind of novels, you know, John Grisham, that kind of stuff. What she does is she opens the book and she reads the first chapter to get the storyline. And then she goes all the way to the end of the book and reads the last chapter to find out what happens. You do the same thing, don't you? Yeah. We watch Survivor with a group of people. We sit down and we watch the first episode, and then she goes online and finds out who won Survivor. She's weird, but she likes living her life this way. Do you know that you know the end of the story? You see, Jesus wins. Faith wins. <laughs> we win. Now we only have to do is figure out the middle of the story. But my friends, when you are living life, knowing the end of the story, you can live life different. Not defeated, but in victory. Because you know that you win with Christ. We win. Jesus Christ came. This is a central theme throughout the book of Ephesians. That Christ came in the church and is partnering with the church. Jesus wins. We can figure out the middle. Jesus' main goal is the church. Not the building, but the people. God could care less about these metal walls, the air conditioning, the chairs that you're sitting on, and everything else. What he cares about is the lives that are a part of this church. The question is, is how are you going to be used within his church to glorify him throughout eternity? What is your part in this middle before we get to the end? Is it being a part of reaching one of the 64 unreached peoples on this planet? Is it being a part of reaching the guy in the cubicle next to you? Or the neighbor next door? Or the family member you live with? How is God wanting to use you to inspire the young people today? To be world changers tomorrow? You see, the question is, how are you going to join Jesus in reaching and teaching the world? Would you bow your heads with me today? Whatever we do, it's not on our own. We do it in the power and the hope and the understanding of our worth in Christ with a great desire to help others understand the greatness of his love for them. Jesus, come. Jesus, come. Today, you're here this morning and uh, your relationship with God has felt a little dry. There's not life. Maybe that there once was, or maybe there's not life today. And you, you just would like to say, Pastor Josh, I need to quit knowing and start knowing. I need to have the eyes of my heart opened to the hope I have, to the worth I have, to the power I have, and the understanding of who Jesus is in the church. First, just first, really quick. You're dry in your faith right now. And you just need to, to walk out with some, some greater sight. If that's you today, would you lift your hand and say, that's me? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Two, three. Anybody else this morning just say, that's me, Pastor Josh? I'm going to raise my hand with you. Thank you. 
four, five, six of us today. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Heavenly Father, I pray today for all of us that raised our hands about gaining sight, Lord, in the area of hope, worth, power, and who you are in the church. God, that you would cause us not to know it with our heads, but experience it with our lives. Lord, that we could be like the lady who could not see and all of a sudden could see. And there would be this openness and power and understanding that comes when we surrender our lives to you, God, and we experience all that you have for us to experience. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Powerful word. Would you stand with us this morning? I want to just encourage you. Um, we're in this study on Ephesians. There's six books in Ephesians. So here's what my challenge is throughout this series. Every week on Monday, you start with chapter one. Tuesday, chapter two. Wednesday, chapter five. Now I'm just kidding. This is messing with some of you that are like, gotta have it. You know, Elizabeth.